You must be Brady. Yes. Yes. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi, Lisa. The examination of children differs from the examination of adults in many significant ways. Unlike adult patients, who typically can be counted on to follow your lead, children tend to vary greatly in their levels of cooperation, requiring you to adapt your examination to the situation at hand. Therefore, you may find it necessary to adjust both the order and style of the examination to the child's mood, behavior, and level of development. In any event, make sure to include all the examination steps, even if they are not in the preferred sequence. And remember, when you complete your post-examination write-up, you will need to place the examination sequence back into its traditional order. To do this, of course, you must become thoroughly familiar with all aspects of the examination and understand how the various steps are interrelated. You can increase the chances of obtaining cooperation from children by remembering the following tips. You can begin the examination with the child sitting on the parent's lap, moving the child to the exam table for the components that require him to lie down. Let the parent undress the child and try to be at the child's eye level. Engage the parents too. Solicit their help in calming the child or otherwise assisting. Including the parents also provides an opportunity to assess temperament and bonding. Engage children in age-appropriate conversation using a playful, reassuring voice. Pedal boards are fun. Do you have a good kick? Yes. Make a game out of the examination. For example, you might say, And can you breathe like a puppy dog and go, let the child see and touch the tools you will use during the examination. Avoid asking the child's permission to examine a body part. After all, you will do the examination regardless. If you cannot console the child, complete the examination expeditiously or give the child a short break. Mastering the techniques of examining children takes time. With practice and experience, you will achieve technical proficiency. In general, you will perform non-disturbing maneuvers early and potentially distressing maneuvers near the end. With the patient's health history in mind and after good hand hygiene, you are ready for the physical examination. Begin with a general survey, inspecting the patient closely, literally from head to toe, in order to form impressions for your later written assessment. During the general survey, you will observe for a wide range of abnormalities, including behavioral problems, such as poor parent-child interactions, sibling rivalry, inappropriate parental discipline, and an overall intense temperament. When engaging the child in age-appropriate conversation, look for signs of developmental delay in areas such as cognitive abilities, language, social and emotional tasks, as well as gross and fine motor skills. This developmental assessment also becomes a key part of the neurological exam. Observe for signs of social or environmental problems, including parental difficulties such as stress or depression and risk for abuse or neglect. Somatic growth is one of the most important indicators of a child's health. A deviation from normal may be an early sign of an underlying problem. The most important tools for assessing somatic growth are growth charts. Growth charts display a series of lines that enable you to establish percentile rankings for your patients, indicating their growth relative to other children of the same chronologic age. To assess trends, plot patients' growth parameters over time. Measure standing height, or stature. You will obtain optimum results using an accurate wall-mounted stadiometer. Have the child stand with the heels back and the head against the wall or the back of the stadiometer. If using a wall with a marked ruler, make sure to place a board or other flat surface across the top of the child's head at a right angle to the ruler. Please note that stand-up weight scales with height attachments are relatively inaccurate. 
Weigh children in their underpants or gown on a stand-up scale. Use the same scales across successive visits to optimize comparability. In general, head circumference is measured until the child reaches 24 months. Afterward, this measurement may be helpful if you suspect a genetic or central nervous system disorder. Age and sex-specific charts are now available to assess body mass index for age. BMI measurements are helpful for early detection of obesity in children older than two years old. It is helpful to give parents their child's BMI results, together with information about the impact of healthy eating and physical activity. If not already taken, measure the blood pressure in children older than two years. Select a blood pressure cuff as you would in adults. It should be wide enough to cover two-thirds of the upper arm or leg. Because hypertension is more common in children than previously thought, it is important to obtain an accurate measurement. Therefore, keep in mind that children have elevated blood pressure during exercise, crying, and anxiety. If the blood pressure is initially elevated, you can measure it again at the end of the examination. Elevated readings must always be confirmed by subsequent measurements. Obtain an accurate pulse rate. Measure the heart rate over a 60-second interval. Here is an overview of the ranges of normal heart rates. The respiratory rate ranges from 20 to 40 per minute during early childhood and 15 to 25 during late childhood, reaching adult levels around age 15. Alternatively, you may use your stethoscope to measure respiratory rate on the chest or in front of the mouth. You can observe for 60 seconds as the child sits quietly with shirt removed. In children, auditory canal temperature recordings are preferred over other methods because they can be obtained quickly with essentially no discomfort. Body temperature in children is less constant than in adults. Examination of the skin is the same for children as for adults. Begin by inspecting and palpating the fingernails, looking especially for any clubbing or cyanosis. Next, inspect the skin of the child's face and upper torso, noting color, pigmentation, texture, hair distribution and thickness, and any lesions. Common skin conditions in preschool children include birthmarks, nevi, and scars. Look for these and other distinguishing characteristics, noting their placement and dimensions. Tailor the examination of the child's head to their stage of growth and development. Even before touching the child, observe the shape of the head, its symmetry, and the presence of abnormal facies, which may not become apparent until later in childhood. So, carefully examine the child's facial features, including symmetry. It is often helpful to compare the child's face to those of the parents. Determine whether facial features fit a recognizable syndrome. Some of the diagnostic facies include Down syndrome, fetal alcohol syndrome, perennial allergic rhinitis, and hyperthyroidism. Examine the child's eyes just as you would in adults. Inspect each cornea, iris, and lens. Check the color of the conjunctiva and sclera. The two most important parts of the eye examination for young children are to test visual acuity in each eye and to determine whether the gaze is conjugate and symmetric. Visual acuity may be difficult to measure in children younger than approximately three years of age who cannot identify pictures on an eye chart. For children older than three years, however, formal visual acuity testing is both feasible and preferred. The examiner may assess visual acuity in broad terms by having the child read letters, numbers, or symbols, or by using an E chart, in which the child is asked to point out which direction the letter E is facing. Yep. To test for conjugate gaze, or to look for strabismus, 
you may perform several tests also used for adults. The first of these tests, the corneal light reflex test, consists of simply observing the reflection of a light from the child's corneas. If you shine a light in front of the child's face and stand about two to three feet away, the reflection should be symmetrical and visible, very slightly nasal to the center of each pupil. The cover-uncover test may assume the form of a game. Have the child look at your smiling face. Cover one of the child's eyes. Then move your covering hand to the child's other eye and see if the first eye moves. Movement of the eye just uncovered may indicate an abnormality. When testing the visual fields in young children, test one eye at a time. Hold the child's head in the midline while bringing an object such as a toy into the field of vision from behind the child. Examining the ear canal and drum can be difficult in young children who are sensitive and fearful because they cannot observe the procedure. Many children need to be restrained during this examination, which is why you may want to leave it for the end. The two best positions to work from include the child lying down and restrained by the parent, or in younger children, sitting on the parent's lap with the child's legs restrained by the parent's legs. To view the tympanic membrane in young children, the auricle must be pulled upward, outward, and backward to afford the best observation with the otoscope. A technique preferred by many pediatricians as a way to hold the otoscope when examining children is to hold the child's head with one hand and with that same hand pull on the auricle. With the other hand, position the otoscope with the handle pointing downward. A pneumatic otoscope allows you to assess the mobility of the tympanic membrane as you increase or decrease the pressure in the external auditory canal by squeezing the rubber bulb. Although formal hearing testing is necessary for accurate detection of hearing deficits in young children, you can grossly test for hearing standing behind the child and have them repeat your whispered words while you cover one of the child's ear canals and rub the tragus using a circular motion. And then you tell me what you hear. Ready? 22. 22. Good. Then test the other ear. Zebra. Zebra. Zebra is right. Good job. Inspect the nose using a large speculum on your otoscope. Check for nasal deviation and polyps and note the color and condition of the nasal mucous membranes. Pale, boggy nasal mucous membranes are found in children with chronic perennial allergic rhinitis. When examining the mouths of young children, you should wear gloves. Ingenuity may be necessary to make the child open his mouth. Here are some tips to encourage the child's cooperation. Turn the examination into a game. Say, And can you breathe like a puppy dog and go, don't show the tongue blade unless absolutely necessary. The child who can say, ah, usually offers a sufficient, albeit brief, view of the posterior pharynx, rendering a tongue blade unnecessary. Good job. Offer enthusiastic praise when children open their mouths a little and encourage them to open even wider. With the child's mouth open, examine the upper and lower lips. Examine the tongue, including the underside. Note the size, position, symmetry, and appearance of the tonsils. The peak growth of tonsillar tissue is between 8 and 16 years. Then, lift the upper lip to examine the upper teeth. Look for staining or signs of erosion, which often first appear here and which may signify the need for a dental referral. Finally, Note the quality of the child's voice. Certain abnormalities can change the pitch and quality of the voice. Examination of a child's neck, including the sternomastoid muscles, is the same as that for adults. The vast majority of enlarged lymph nodes in children are due to infections and not malignant disease. Lymphadenopathy is common in childhood. Check the neck for mobility. 
ensure that the neck is supple and easily mobile in all directions. This is particularly important when the child is holding the head asymmetrically and when central nervous system disease, such as meningitis, is suspected. Normally, children should be able to sit upright and touch their chins to their chests. In children, nuchal rigidity is a more reliable indicator of meningeal irritation than is Brzezinski's sign or Koenig's sign. Nearly all children with nuchal rigidity are extremely sick, irritable, and difficult to examine. As children age, the lung examination becomes similar to that for adults. Auscultation usually is easiest when a child barely notices. Carefully assess respirations and the pattern of breathing. An important tip is not to rush to the stethoscope, but rather to first observe the child carefully. Assess the relative proportion of time spent on inspiration versus expiration. The normal ratio is one to one. Prolonged inspirations or expirations are a clue to disease location. For example, prolonged expiration is a frequent sign of asthma or lower airway obstruction. Note any effort or work of breathing, including nasal flaring and grunting. Although as children grow, these signs grow less helpful in assessing for respiratory pathology. Palpation, percussion, and auscultation achieve greater importance in a careful examination of the thorax and lungs. Examination of the heart and vascular system in infants and children is similar to adults, but you must use your knowledge of the developmental stage of each child to make the examination easier and more productive. Let children move the stethoscope themselves, going back to listen properly. Measure the blood pressure in the right arm. If the child is three to four years old, measure it in both arms and one leg at a time to check for possible coarctation of the aorta. It is important to keep in mind that most school-aged children have a benign heart murmur at some point in their lives. The most common, Stills murmur, is a grade one to two over six musical, vibratory, early and mid-systolic murmur with multiple overtones, located over the mid or lower sternal border, but also frequently heard over the carotid arteries. Compression of the carotid artery usually causes the precordial murmur to disappear. The murmur will also diminish as the child goes from supine to sitting to standing. Also in preschool or school-aged children, you may detect a venous hum this is a soft, hollow, continuous sound, louder in diastole, heard just below the right clavicle. It can be completely eliminated by maneuvers that affect venous return, such as lying supine, changing head position, or performing jugular venous compression. A venous hum has the same quality as breath sounds and therefore is frequently overlooked. The murmur heard in the carotid area, or just above the clavicles, is known as the carotid bruit. It is early and mid-systolic, with a slightly harsh quality. It is usually louder on the left, and may be heard alone or in combination with Still's murmur. It may also be completely eradicated by carotid artery compression. Examination of the breasts in young children consists solely of inspection because in both sexes there is little breast tissue. To examine the abdomen of a young child, have the patient lie supine with knees flexed. Many children are ticklish, so distraction can be important. Chatting with the child can help him relax, as can placing your whole hand flush on the abdominal surface for a few moments without probing. For particularly sensitive children, try placing the child's hand under yours. Eventually, you will be able to remove the child's hand and palpate the abdomen freely. Palpate lightly in all areas, then deeply, leaving the site of potential pathology to the end. Begin palpating low on the abdomen, moving your hand upward, 
so that you do not miss the edge of the liver or spleen. One method to determine the lower border of the liver involves the scratch test. Place the diaphragm of your stethoscope just above the right costal margin at the midclavicular line. With your fingernail, lightly scratch the skin of the abdomen along the midclavicular line moving from below the umbilicus toward the costal margin. When your scratching finger reaches the liver's edge, you will hear a change in the scratching sound as it passes through the liver to your stethoscope. The spleen, like the liver, is felt easily in most children. It too is soft with a sharp edge and projects downward like a tongue from under the left costal margin. The spleen is movable and rarely extends more than one to two centimeters below the costal margin. Palpate the other abdominal structures. You will commonly note pulsations in the epigastrium caused by the aorta. This is most easily felt to the left of the midline on deep palpation. Begin examination of the male genitalia by inspecting the penis. The size in prepubertal children has little significance unless it is abnormally large. In obese boys, the fat pad over the symphysis pubis may obscure the penis. There is an art to palpation of the young male scrotum and testes because many have an extremely active cremasteric reflex that may cause the testis to retract upwards into the inguinal canal and thereby appear to be undescended. Therefore, Examine the male child when he is relaxed because anxiety stimulates the cremasteric reflex. With warm hands, palpate the lower abdomen, working your way downward toward the scrotum along the inguinal canal. A useful technique is to increase intra-abdominal pressure by asking the child to do a sit-up. If you can detect the testis in the scrotum, it is descended even if it spends much time in the inguinal canal. Examine the inguinal canal as you would for adults, noting any swelling that may reflect an inguinal hernia. Have the boy increase abdominal pressure and note whether a bulge in the inguinal canal increases. The female genitalia examination can be anxiety provoking for the older child and adolescent, but if not performed, a significant finding may be missed. The examination of external female genitalia is the same for all ages of children. Use a calm, gentle approach, including a developmentally appropriate explanation as you do the examination. A bright light source is essential. Most children can be examined in the supine frog leg position. If the child seems reluctant, it may be helpful to have the parents sit on the examination table with the child or the examination may be performed while the child sits in the parent's lap, as shown here. Examine the genitalia in an efficient and systematic manner. Inspect the external genitalia for pubic hair, the size of the clitoris, the color and size of the labia majora, and any rashes, bruises, or other lesions. Next, visualize the structures by separating the labia with your fingers, as shown here. You can also apply gentle traction by grasping the labia between your thumb and index finger of each hand and separating the labia majora laterally and posteriorly to examine the inner structures. Note the condition of the labia minora, urethra, hymen, and proximal vagina. If you are unable to visualize the edges of the hymen, ask the child to take a deep breath to relax the abdominal muscles. Another useful technique is to position the patient in a knee-chest position, as shown here. Avoid touching the hymenal edges because the hymen is very tender without the protective effects of hormones. Examine for discharge, labial adhesions, estrogenization, hymenal variations, and hygiene. The physical examination may reveal signs of sexual abuse and may require more complete evaluation by an expert in the field. The rectal examination is not routine, but should be done whenever intra-abdominal, pelvic, or pararectal disease is suspected. 
In older children, abnormalities of the upper extremities are rare in the absence of injury. The normal young child has increased lumbar concavity, decreased thoracic convexity, and often a protuberant abdomen. You will detect most abnormalities by watching carefully from both the front and behind as the child stands and walks barefoot, touches his toes, and runs a short distance. To check for scoliosis, perform the Adams-Benn test if the child is at least six years old. Have the child stand with his bare feet together and bend forward with the knees straight and the arms hanging straight down. Look for any asymmetry in positioning. If you detect scoliosis, use a scoliometer to test for the degree of scoliosis. Finally, check for leg length discrepancy by having the child stand straight as you observe from behind. Place your hands on his iliac crests. Your hand should be perfectly parallel to the floor. Test for severe hip disease by observing from behind as the child shifts weight from one leg to the other. A pelvis that remains level when weight is borne on the unaffected side is a negative Trendelenburg sign. But with an abnormal positive sign in severe hip disease, the pelvis tilts toward the unaffected hip during weight bearing on the affected side. For children age eight or older, perform a sports pre-participation screening musculoskeletal examination. Organized sports often require this medical clearance in order for the child to participate. Refer to the textbook for the details of this examination. The neurological examination of the child includes the basic components evaluated in adults with the addition of a developmental examination. The sensory examination can be performed by slightly tickling the child's skin using a cotton ball or soft object and asking the child to indicate when he feels it. Make sure the child's eyes are closed and don't use a pin because it will scare the child. Observe the child's gait and coordination while the child is walking and running. Note any asymmetries, weakness, undue tripping, or clumsiness. To check for gross motor development and balance, Ask the child to balance on one foot and to hop. You might try asking him to walk on his heels if he is old enough to perform this maneuver. If you are concerned about the child's strength, have the child lie on the floor and then stand up and closely observe the stages. Most normal children will first sit up, then flex the knees and extend the arms to the side to push off from the floor and stand up. Hand preference is demonstrated by most children by age two. Check for weakness in the non-preferred upper extremity. Test for deep tendon reflexes as in adults. You can show the child the reflex hammer, treating it like a toy so he is not frightened. Distract the child or ask him to close his eyes so he does not see the impact of the hammer and provide a false reaction. To check for fine motor development, Ask the child to copy an X or a square or draw a person which should display several body parts. Then discuss their pictures to test for cognition and language as well. The cerebellar examination can be performed by asking the child to touch your finger and then his nose and by having him perform rapid hand movements. Children older than five years old should be able to tell right from left so you can assign them right-left discrimination tasks as well. The cranial nerves can be assessed using developmentally appropriate strategies. Cranial nerve 1, which mediates sense of smell, is generally not tested at this age. Cranial nerve 2, which mediates vision, is usually assessed in part by testing for visual acuity. Use the Snellen chart or E-chart for those children ages 3 years and older. Cranial nerve 2, along with cranial nerve 3, controls response to light. You will have tested for this previously during the child's eye assessment. Cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6, which mediate extraocular movement, can be tested by having the child track light or an object 
as in your earlier eye assessment. The motor portion of cranial nerve 5 innervates the muscles of mastication, while the sensory portion mediates facial sensation and the sensory part of the corneal reflex. Cranial nerve 5 may be assessed by having the child smile. Cranial nerve 7 innervates all muscles of facial movement and expression and should be assessed by asking the child to make faces. Cranial nerve 8 mediates hearing and vestibular function and should be assessed in a formal hearing testing session. Cranial nerves 9 and 10 mediate the sensory and motor functions of the palate, pharynx, and larynx. These nerves are assessed by asking the child to stick out his whole tongue and move it back and forth. Cranial nerve 11 innervates the sternomastoid muscles and upper trapezius muscles and is assessed by having the child push your hand away with his head. Cranial nerve 12 mediates motor functions of the tongue, affecting articulation of words. To assess, observe the child's speaking ability. Remember that a clear, well-organized clinical record employing language that is neutral, professional, and succinct is one of the most important adjuncts to patient care. HENT was normal, neck was supple, lungs were clear, heart regular rate and rhythm with no murmur, abdomen was soft. After practice and further review of this video, make sure you have mastered the important learning objectives for examining children.